Daisy. And I'm Terry. And this is the Monday, Monday Mindset, Mindset Podcast, Podcast, where we share things of interest to us and hopefully to you. So let's get started with episode number 83. And this week, it's Terry's turn to share something. What have you got for us today, Terry? Well, Daisy, I actually struck out and listened to a different podcast da, this da, time. Da. One that I, that's <laughs> right, one that I'd never listened to before. That was a risk, especially considering you didn't have much time. <laughs> that's right. Living boldly. <laughs> um, so the podcast is called Untangle, Mindfulness for Curious Humans. Hmm. And I thought... Well, it certainly sounds like one that's going to be yeah, interesting. I thought yes. this, this could be helpful. So the guest is Dr. Ellen Hendrickson, and she wrote a book called Quiet the Inner Critic and Rise Above Social Anxiety. Mm. And I thought this sounded like a good topic for us, interwoven with some topics that we've covered before, but just adding some different thoughts and perspectives. And toward the end of it, she was talking about avoidance behaviors, which reminded uh -huh. me of the last <laughs> episode that I shared about avoidance behaviors. Well, that would probably, I can see that going well with the old inner critic. Uh-huh. So in general, talked about the idea that social anxiety is really a fear of being scrutinized, judged, or found lacking in social or performance situations that gets in your way of doing things you want to do. And I think this is an important definition. Mm -hmm. And as with most things in kind of the mental health world, really a spectrum of intensity of very frequently experienced, but not too interfering versus pathologically preventing you from living a whole life. Mm -hmm. She talked about the idea that the inner critic really is universal. We all have it to some degree. And it actually exists as an old function to help keep us alive. And I liked this little phrase she uses. She says, we doubt ourselves to check ourselves. Because we have to be safe. We have to not isolate ourselves from our whole tribe way back when or, or whatever. And so we needed these abilities to check our behaviors. But also the idea that too much of an inner critic then gets in our way and decreases the quality of life. So the two talked then about, well, how do you decide when it's too much or when it's useful? And the idea of when does it surpass normal and get into that category of kind of being pathological? And so Dr. Hendrickson said that she uses two criteria, distress and impairment. So for example, if I'm going to give a speech and I'm uncomfortable giving a speech and it makes me nervous and I get very nervous before the speech, that is just normal social anxiety, normal inner critic happening. That's okay. But let's say I am going to walk out in my hallway to go to the elevator and I'm afraid to do that because I'm afraid of people. Mm. That's where it is more in the pathological or really need some serious intervention status. It's that whole, I really liked what you said right at the beginning, when it gets in the way of doing things you want to do. Mm -hmm. And because otherwise, who cares? Don't bother <laughs> addressing it. Mm. It's when it holds us back. And so the next big criteria, she said, is impairment when it gets in the way of the life you want to live. So for example, if I am a college student and I'm nervous to speak in class, but 20% of my grade depends on class participation, that fear, that discomfort, that inner critic is going to affect my outcome. It will hold me back. If my value is getting an A, mm. I'm not going to be able to do that if I don't work through this fear and this avoidance. So I think it's an important thing to kind of look at where are you on different things that um, may hold you back. Dr. Hendrickson then talked about just kind of looking at people's self-report. And I know there are issues with self-report and sometimes they're over self-reported, but often they're under self-reported. 
And in a study of Americans in a particular population, they looked at 40% of Americans self-identify as shy. And she talked about the idea that shy is really just a colloquialism for socially anxious, um, fearful. And 80% identify as formerly shy. Like they might talk about themselves as kids. They hid behind their mom's leg when they were in public or, you know, something like that. And 13% of people in this study identify it impairing their lives to the point where it reaches that threshold of an actual mental health diagnosis that really needs more intervention. And then she went in to talk a little more detail about that fear of being judged or rejected. And she said that basically it's that we hold a perception, and she really emphasized the word perception. It might be factual, but it oftentimes is not. We hold a perception that we have a fatal flaw Mm -hmm. and that it will be revealed Mm -hmm. and then we will have to face the consequences. So I can see you smiling right now and you can see (laughs) me smiling right now because I think we've both talked about this in various things that we avoid, we put off, is that at some level the fear is I'm going to be exposed that I'm not competent enough at this, I'm not smart enough, I'm not good enough, something. And... I will, you know, get fired once that is understood or people won't want to be friends with me once they know that or whatever it is. So she then talked about basically three bases of why we have social anxiety, how we develop it. And first she talked about genetics and I would love to read her book and learn a little bit more about this because I tend to think not as much of it is genetic as learned. But she does talk about there being some genetic component. And research shows that someone is six to eight times more likely to experience any form of anxiety if their parents were anxious. And again, I would love to see this research because sometimes it's hard to decipher, is that genetic cause or is that a learned cause? But she does go into that a little bit. So next she talks about it being learned and that we could really learn it in a couple of ways. We may have grown up in a home or with people that were modeling anxious behavior. And so we learned that as normal ways to respond to things. Or we may have grown up with people who were laser focused on a social threat or oriented to the world as being critical. So let's say, for example, if you're six and you come downstairs with an outfit on and your mom says to you, no, you can't wear that. People will think I don't know how to dress you Mm -hmm. and they'll think that we're this. So that can heighten someone's sense of um, anxiety and that inner critic. And then the last one she talked about is we learn it as a coping mechanism to avoid that fatal flaw being perceived. And that in order to prevent that, we use safety behaviors. And she goes through an example with a client. This woman who wrote this book is a psychologist. So she gives an example of a client who his fatal flaw that he was afraid that would be revealed is that he wasn't smart enough. So when he was hanging out with his friends, rather than tell a story or share an experience, he would just remain quiet because he didn't want them to know that he wasn't smart enough. And these were friends. These were, this wasn't even in a group of strangers. Mm-hmm. So his safety behavior was to remain quiet. But it cost him engaging and having his friends know more about him. So just kind of thinking of that, the three reasons or general causes of how we develop this. Then the interviewer asked her, she said, you know, but you're kind of talking about the fear of being judged. And No, I think all of us, we've probably read a meme about this or said a saying about this thousands of times in our lives. Like, we shouldn't care what other people think of us. We shouldn't live our lives based on other people's thoughts. But she said, you know, the truth is we live in a very judgmental society, many of us. And often we grew up in an environment that was judgmental and reinforced those messages a lot. Dr. Hendrickson said, yes, this is true. And she encourages people to take these two things into account. Anxiety is often disproportionate. 
She didn't say always, and she really wanted to emphasize that. Let's say, for example, you have been physically abused and someone is talking to you and raising their voice and you get anxious. Your anxiety may not be disproportionate based on your prior experience, but oftentimes our anxiety is disproportionate to the actual risk. And then also anxiety is often not credible. It may be based on information from the past or cues that we're receiving, but that doesn't always make it accurate. And so she used this analogy that I think is kind of helpful to think about. She said, you know, our anxiety, our social anxiety, it's like a burglar alarm. It becomes problematic when it's set too sensitively. Mm -hmm. You want your alarm to go off when someone is breaking into your home. But you don't want your alarm to go off when a squirrel runs past your door. And where it gets into that more interfering place is when the sensitivity level is set too high. Makes sense. I really liked that way to frame it. Mm. In her book, she talks about having an inner rule book and really focusing on the idea that this often creates in us a sense of perfectionism. And she said that she wants to clarify that perfectionism doesn't mean we want to be perfect. That more, it's the fear of never being good enough. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes when people hear perfectionism, they really focus on that perfect place of people want to do everything perfect and everything to look perfect. But really, it's more about that underlying fear that I'm not quite good enough. So I create rules that have high, rigid, and arbitrary standards. I was thinking about a client that I worked with many years ago who was very anxious. And we talked about an example of how she doesn't get to bed on time because she has to do all the dishes. And she was a single mom of several kids and very busy, full-time job and things. And she couldn't go to bed because she still had dishes to do. And we just started looking at this high, rigid, and arbitrary standard of, so you're only a good enough person or a good mom if when you go to bed, there's not one single dirty dish in your kitchen. And that was the belief that she held, that Mm -hmm. that would mean that she wasn't doing well, that she wasn't being who she was supposed to be. Dr. Hendrickson shared an example of, she had a client who believed she should never offend anyone which I think is a a good belief as long as you don't go too far with it. So she really interpreted, even if I don't intend to, it is wrong for me to offend anyone. And so she held herself back from saying and doing almost anything out of this fear. I was going to say, I can see how that would easily become overthought to a place where you would be afraid of saying anything. Yeah. And so this idea that she had to work with this client to get to the level where she could accept not intentionally offending someone is what's important to me, but recognizing and accepting sometimes it will happen unintentionally. And that is part of human interaction. Mm. I can't prevent that. Or if I do prevent that, I limit myself in relationships. So I think as you just kind of listen to the way she's framing it, you can start to hear about ways to loosen those rules a little bit, loosen those standards. They then talked about this way to think about it that I think is really important. And I kind of held on to this after the interview. When our fear is being judged. So let's say, for example, my fear is I'm going to be seen as not knowing how to dress well based on what I'm wearing. And let's say, for example, it's one of those days where I wore one blue shoe and one brown shoe. (laughs) They talked about there's a difference between people noticing versus judging. Mm. And our Mm. assumption is that because they notice, they are judging us critically. Dr. Hendrickson really emphasized it's okay to recognize, yeah, people will notice this. So let's say I'm playing a piano recital and I skip a page and the song doesn't make sense. Yes, people will notice that. But I don't have to assume that means they're going to say, Terry's a horrible person and she should never play piano again. That's the harsh critical judgment that I'm anticipating or perceiving. 
the interviewer was asking a lot about, well, who is more likely to suffer from this? Is it introverts over extroverts? Is it highly sensitive people more so than other people? Or, you know, is it based on our history and things? And Dr. Hendrickson, I think, tried to kind of um, dispel the idea that there's one category of us that are most at risk for this. And, you know, even extroverts can be socially anxious. Actually, for them, it's even harder because they need that social interaction even more, Mm -hmm. but they fear it. So it's not limited to one category. But they talked about particularly people who grew up or in an environment where they were basically kind of walking a tightrope a very high standards that were very rigid. And one thing that we can do then to help ourselves, if that's kind of our background, is to start to question if our rules need to be so rigid. So could my client say, Would it be okay if I left one day's worth of dishes in the sink and then did them in the morning? Do I need to be this rigid about it? Or is that just a a belief that I learned and then I'm over applying? And also to question kind of the arbitrary nature of some of these beliefs. Question if it's actually true and is it getting in the way of life or relationships? So... In my client example, I could maybe work with her to see, yep, that's what she's believed and that's how she's lived. But if she went to her best friend's house Hmm. and there were dishes in the sink, would she think her best friend was a horrible mom and, you know, an incompetent adult? And most likely she would say no. Okay, well, so that rule isn't true. Yes, it's not a universally known truth. Yeah. Yeah. It's a mistaken belief that we've learned to accept as truth. And so basically, this process is for us to work on moving from the black and white thinking to the shades of gray. Like, do I like going to bed and having all of my dishes done? Yes, that feels good. Okay. But is it life-threatening if I don't? Am I a bad person if I don't? And learning to navigate those shades of gray. And she talked about two kind of factors that she encourages people to use as a almost like a litmus test of stretching that rigidity. And those are connection and enjoyment. Is holding on to this rule interfering with my connection with other people? So I'll use an example of my own life for this one. I am a messy person. (laughs) And there are times when my home would be so messy that I would not let anyone come in. Now, Right now, I don't even know anyone in town, really, so no one would stop by. But at various times, there could be people stopping by, and I wouldn't let people in because of the mess. And so my rigid beliefs or fear and anxiety interfered with connecting with people. So that would be something to really work on addressing. And then also enjoyment is holding on to that belief, that rule and getting anxious about it, interfering with your enjoyment of things. And she used an example of a client of hers who, when he would watch television, he would always watch documentaries. And when she asked him about it, because he was very rigid about it, his belief was watching something that, like watching a comedy was a waste of time and that he Mm. should watch documentaries because that would justify spending time. Because he was learning something. But he didn't enjoy them as much. (laughs) (laughs) And so does it interfere with your connections or does it interfere with your enjoyment? And if so, really worth working on. So they started talking a little bit more about what to do about it. And one thing that Dr. Hendrickson talked about is starting to practice the act of putting actions in place before we're fully motivated to do something. And I thought this was a great topic for a whole nother um, discussion, but she talked about it in relation to things where we're feeling socially anxious, like I can't play in that concert because I'm not perfect in playing my violin yet. And she talked about not waiting until you have the confidence, not waiting until you have the evidence that you're, good enough at this, but to go ahead and join the concert. 
do the performance because then you can gain the experience of doing well. And as you and I have talked about in other episodes, you can even gain the experience of it not going perfectly, but you recovering. Mm. And it can help us to not need to employ so much avoidance behavior. Just put the action into place. And then she talked about things that might hold us back from that and encouraged us to think a little bit about, is the task something I just don't want to do, hate doing, or is it something that I actually value doing, but I'm holding myself back from? And she used the caveat, nope, taxes don't count here. It's okay. You hate doing them. You still do them. But other things like, okay, my friend wants me to skydive. Nope. I have no interest in that. Okay, then the avoidance behavior makes a lot of sense and there's no need to challenge that. Versus I want to be really connected. I want to have a good social support network and have friends and enjoy social times. But my social anxiety is making me think that I'm probably going to bail on my the plans I have with my friends tonight. That's working against the value that you're really working toward. I want to be connected to these people. So I need to put the action into place Go ahead and go out with them and get to experience that, oh, yeah, I enjoy that Mm. and build on that experience. Or I guess reassess, not reassess, but go ahead and do it and then figure out ways to change your approach. Absolutely. If something doesn't go according to plan. Absolutely. I like this next thing she talked about. She described thinking of social anxiety as part of our script rather than a reason to actually avoid something. So when we do something, we have kind of a script that we follow. When I'm getting ready to play a basketball game, I eat a few hours before, I get my uniform ready, I put my uniform on a half hour before, I do warm-ups, and then I play the game. So we have a script. And she said, what if you thought about your social anxiety just as part of your natural script? Okay, I'm going to go out with my friends. I accept the invitation. The day of, I make plans for what time I need to leave. I get socially anxious about how it might go. I get ready. I go and I come home and I realize that I enjoyed it and I'm glad I went. Interesting. Just kind of accept that it's part of Mm. the routine rather than, uh uh-oh, this means I shouldn't do it. And talking about that and the idea of kind of surfing the initial anxiety rather than letting it determine our behaviors. And then emphasize the quote that many people are familiar with, basically, that our thoughts are real, but not always true. It's okay to have the thought, but it doesn't mean that we have to believe it and follow it. So Dr. Hendrickson suggested with this Because then the question becomes, well, how do I know if it's true or if it's a distortion? And she referred to an idea of cognitive diffusion, putting a little distance in between those thoughts. And she said she encourages people to use the phrase, and I'm pretty sure you and I have talked about this one before, I'm having the thought that. So rather than saying, I can't do that, Mm. to say, I'm having the thought that I can't do that. So it already sets out, it doesn't mean it's true. It's a thought that I'm having. And we can kind of distance ourselves from it a little bit to observe it. She also talked about maybe writing out our fears and what pieces of them are true or which of them are true and what parts of them or which of them are open to new opportunities to learn and understand differently. She gave a couple other tips that I'll go over before we end here. She talked about prompts, making a list of challenge things, things that you want to do, but fear is holding you back from doing. And then you kind of look at them. How big is the fear? Is this one that seems impossible or just challenging? And then you work through them from easiest to the hardest. And again, this is an opportunity for us to gain experience that not avoiding these behaviors helps us feel better. We do actually enjoy that. We feel good about the accomplishment so that we're more likely to 
start tackling the harder ones on the list, but we build our confidence first. And oh, that makes sense. That's like a cognitive behavioral technique. Isn't Absolutely. It? It sounded familiar. Yeah. <laughs> and really going back to the avoidance behavior that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, avoidance reinforces the fear as being true, or it reinforces that we can't handle it. But by going through this list and doing the easier ones first, it helps teach us that we don't need to avoid and that we can handle things that are uncomfortable. She also talked about a process of replacing. So talking back to our thoughts. If our thought says, you're not skilled enough at this to say, it's okay that I'm not skilled enough yet. I'm ready to tackle this. Just how would you kind of refute that limiting statement? She talked about the other one of embracing, accepting, or surfing that wave as anxious thoughts try to hold us back, but that we can let go of that life preserver and do the event anyway. And the last one she talked about is the idea that our attention is like a spotlight. It helps us look at something more clearly. And unfortunately, when we're anxious, we tend to focus our spotlight inward. So we're only looking inside of our thoughts and our feelings and our physical reactions. And so in these situations, if we can actually imagine turning the spotlight outward. So instead of focusing solely on ourselves, because that's when we're more likely to trip up, when we're so focused inward, Mm. to start focus the spotlight on the person you're talking to or the situation you're in so that you can observe it versus being so solely focused on your inner experience. And that helps us to attend to the other person or that moment. And then the social anxiety doesn't hold us back. Well, that sounds like a very content rich episode. And one that I'd be very interested in listening to in its entirety, because yeah, that all sounds very interesting. And certainly lots of things personally, I could learn from But there are some interesting things that sort of, as so often is the case, sort of loop back around. Something that you brought up at the beginning about how we all have an inner critic to a certain degree and that it serves a purpose, you know, or it certainly served a good purpose ancestrally in helping keep us alive. I suppose it's that It's like that niggling fear, you know, if if we didn't have any fear, you think, again, thinking of memes and things, how we're supposed to be fearless and all the rest of it. Well, actually, yes, that's quite good. If you're too fearful, you need to head a bit more towards the fearless end Mm -hmm. of the spectrum. But actually being completely fearless has its own problems and challenges and is quite likely to get you killed. (laughs) Absolutely. So, you know, with all these things, you don't actually necessarily want to push too far to the other end of the spectrum. And I really liked what you said further on about embracing it really as part of the dialogue, just, I guess, normalizing it Mm -hmm. and making it part just a natural part of the process Mm -hmm. because that you know you fear it less I really liked that distinction between noticing something and judging it Mm -hmm. and how that always gets linked to our perception Mm. no they're not noticing they're noticing and they're judging Mm -hmm. (laughs) at the same time and that but that's our perception that's us loading something onto that external Mm -hmm. person looking in that quite possibly quite probably even just isn't even there in the first place shows how things get distorted doesn't it and in my mind and again I know this is one of those things easier said than done and I still struggle with it at times but even if they are judging it does their opinion really change my value or change my decision? Someone may think what I'm doing is really stupid, and that's okay. Unless that's the most important person to me and I value their opinion, then I might want to think, huh, if Daisy thinks this is stupid, is there something about it that's not helping me? But even then, it shouldn't stop you doing it. It should maybe just get you to investigate further. 
Absolutely. Or maybe have a conversation with the person you think's judging you to make sure they're judging you in the first place. (laughs) (laughs) It goes round and round, doesn't it? And then still deciding what I'm going to do with it. Yeah. Exactly. (laughs) And I like that it's such a good recommendation that always comes in is having that distance to observe it. And what you said about rephrasing it in saying I'm having a thought that, but also how you mentioned earlier on about the client with the washing the dishes and how would she feel if she went to a friend's house? That's the other thing, isn't it? Is transposing what you're thinking about onto somebody else that you care about and thinking about how you would view Mm -hmm. that situation and them you know, if that situation were tied to them rather than to you. Mm -hmm. Because that's that's a kind of immediate, oh, okay, maybe I am judging myself a bit harshly then because Mm -hmm. if I walked into my friend's house and saw some dishes in the sink, wouldn't really think anything of it. Mm -hmm. So how come I'm thinking so badly of myself for doing the same thing? Yeah, really kind of questioning out the rigidity and arbitrary nature of the rules that you're imposing on yourself. Mm. Absolutely. Well, there's certainly a great deal there for me to think about, as is so often the case. I feel like you're talking directly to me and my current (laughs) situation (laughs) problems that I'm going through. So lots of things to talk about. Very, very interesting. Thanks for that. (laughs) Absolutely. And if you think about it, Daisy, if if listeners are really, I'll say this in a British way, keen to do so, (laughs) they could probably go back and listen to all of our episodes as diagnostic criteria of what you and I are struggling (laughs) with in our own um, journeys. (laughs) Yes, of course, because we're naturally going to be drawn to things that we're finding challenging. Occasionally, we'll just look at a podcast and think, well, that looks interesting. It's nothing to do with anything Uh that, you know, that I struggle with. It just looks interesting. But yes, so often you're drawn to things that you're struggling with yourself, aren't you? Absolutely. So y'all, if you want to go out and diagnose (laughs) Daisy and I, we've given you 83 episodes now. But I I hope that there are some things in this episode that are useful to help quiet your inner critic and use them in ways that are useful, but not allowing them to take over and prevent you from living the life that you want to be living. Absolutely. Because that's what it's all about. Well, I hope you have a very wonderful week. You too, Daisy. Take good care, everybody. Bye-bye.